Yeah, I'm joined today with my uh, high school buddy, Ronnie Shannon. Of course, I knew Al Templeton from Southport High School as well. And I think in starting out this program today, Al, if you would just raise your hand and wave like that so people will know. And then Ronnie, if you'll wave, there you go. Um, that's kind of what tied our communities together, really, with Southport High School. Um, I noticed when Al sent his photo in for the Historical Society uh, for the newsletter, he uh, put in a picture of when he played football for Southport High School. And um, the beautiful thing about Southport High School is that we had grades one through 12. So I'm down in the lower grades with Ronnie, but Al was a senior uh, getting ready to graduate. And Al, correct me if I'm wrong, but I noticed your number was number 22, but I sort of remember you as being the quarterback. Yeah, I was. They had they didn't have any sort of uh, number protocol back then. Uh, uh, yeah. We had so few people on the team that we had to play both ways. You know, offense right. and defense. So. so, were you playing in the days of eight man football? Yeah. Uh, when I was in the eighth grade, the eight Southport won three straight eight man state championships. And I was in the eighth grade for one of them and ninth for one and 10th grade for one. Uh, I, I, so I was only in, in two of those games, two of those football games. Okay, well, so we're going to take the trip from Southport High School and we're going to head over to what is now called Oak Island. But before we get there, we got to cross one of the bridges and we're going back in time and we're going to cross the old swing bridge and we're gonna take us across the island and I'm gonna turn it over to you guys because the story begins. We wouldn't even be talking about this if it wasn't for a fellow by the name of E.F. Middleton. So you guys take it from there. Well, um, E.F. Middleton uh, bought the island for timber back in the 1930s and about the late 30s, 38, 39, right in there, he got this crazy idea to turn it into a, a, a community, resort community, where people could come and visit the beach. Back then, uh, the land wasn't as valuable uh, as, say, something around Leland and Bolivia because you couldn't grow crops there. It, was, it, uh, it had all those uh, oak trees and pine trees and stuff in the way. And... Uh, so his idea was to buy it for the timber. And then over time, he saw what uh, Colonel Springs was doing down in Myrtle Beach and, uh, and, and doing it very successfully. So he decided to do the same thing. And he, he had this vision after a few years, that he wanted to turn it into a town. And that had never been considered before. It was just raw acreage on this island full of scrub oaks. And so he, he decided to turn it into a town. And uh, of course he was named the first mayor <laughs> and the second and the third. But it helped if you own it. Yeah, yeah and, and so his idea, <laughs> he said, this, this town is no good to me if, uh, if we don't have people here. So what we're gonna talk about primarily is the people who helped populate that town and how he facilitated that, that growth and that population explosion uh, from zero year-round residents to uh, 102 year-round residents in 1960. That was an explosion. Yeah. From 102. So, so that's it. And that's where Ronnie's family came into play. Uh, he, one thing we're going to talk about is the... Uh, the number of people who took a chance, who figuratively packed up their truck and moved to the beach and said, here I am, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a plumber at the beach. I'm right. gonna be an electrician here. I'm gonna open a hot dog stand here. And, and Dan Shannon, of course, opened a store that led to uh, him having the, I guess, the franchise for the US Post Office. Uh, had a Texaco gas and, and he, he worked it. He literally worked it from uh, sunrise to sunset. And so that, yeah. that, that's, he's one of the very first. 
Yeah, and I think when you're talking about that too, there's a lot of people that we're gonna we're gonna try to mention, but there is also so many that we'll probably forget who came down and contributed, whose names will never be brought up. But those people yeah. were just as important as my mom and dad, you know, and and, did, and worked hard to make it what it is. And of course, you got to remember, you know, Al's family, how hard they worked, Mr. Jumpin worked to to make the island what it is. He worked long, hard hours to to make Oak Island what yeah. it is today. So, and the, and the other thing, we can only go up to a certain point because after the, like we can't start in the 30s, obviously, because right. we weren't around, but we were, we, we were there from the 50s, uh, you know, up to maybe, uh, I think about 75 or 80 is when things, the kind population of grew yeah. so much that uh, there were a lot of people who moved there on a wing and a prayer that we can't keep track of, but we, we can we can talk about the early ones. Um, you know, John, I think Johnny Vereen was the first big store that- It was the big, yeah. He, he was yeah. the big one and uh, he opened a red and white supermarket. Uh, and, and I remember, uh, well, you remember the story behind that, but he, he moved there and he didn't own the land. That's right, yeah. Uh, uh, well, Mr. Milton was was good about that. I know. I know that uh, in the winter time, of course, when only a hundred people there and living around, living year round, there wasn't a whole lot of money, and so Dad couldn't make some of his payments in the winter time and had to put them off to the summer. And it was never an issue, you know. And I think Mr. Milton would rather have people there than to have somebody just uh, pack up and leave. You know. Yeah, he wanted to make it. He wanted people to be successful, and Johnny had big plans. He wanted to build build a. Uh, he wanted to put a building supply store uh, where he ended up building, uh, but he didn't own the land and he didn't have a lot of money, but he had the will. And Mr. Middleton says, I, I need, we, if we're gonna have any people, we have to have a food store. And so Johnny right. didn't have any money for the land. So Mr. Middleton said, well, you can build a store on my land. Uh, and he said, well, I don't have any money for inventory. And, Mr. Milton gave him $15,000 for his inventory. Uh, and by the time my dad came along in later years, he said, you know, uh, Mr. Milton, that, that, that Vereen fellow hadn't paid for his land yet. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's, uh, he's working hard and that's what we need. That is what we need. And so anybody who had the the, the determination and the work ethic he would he would support and he would he would put them yeah. there to build the town i never i never had the chance to meet him but i hear so many good stories about him and you know the kind of you know he was a businessman making good decisions back then but he also still had that that touch you know about dealing with people on a personal level at least from the stories i've heard about him you know, I was kind of, and kind of preparing for today, I kind of looked him up a little bit, Mr. E.F. Middleton, and I found the Historical Society published an article a while back uh, from uh, the chronology of Southport, where they talked about, you know, he was a timber buyer, and his fee was $25,000 for this property to a pulpwood concern, and instead of taking his $25,000 fee, he took ownership of the land on the ocean side of the Intracoastal Waterway from the gates of the literal Fort Caswell to Lockwood Folly Inlet. And then all that development started after that. Um, it's pretty amazing, really, when you think about it. And uh, he seems to be a pretty amazing guy in terms of not only his business savvy, but in his personal relationships with the people that you're talking about, you know, because I, I, I refer to it sometimes as two hands full of people lived year round and kind of through them, you can tell the history of what was Yopon, Long Beach and became Oak Island and even Caswell Beach. So pretty, pretty um, remarkable fellow, Mr. E.F. Middleton. So Al, didn't your father work for a uh, national development company? Yeah, national development was actually the last company that, that came out of, it, it started out as EF Middleton and Son. Right. 
And he, and of course, Mr. Milton's son uh, never, <laughs> he didn't have a knack for uh, the land builders business. And he was in the Air Force. He was a career Air Force and he was an Air Force pilot. Uh, so he, he never actually worked there, but that became Carolina Lands and out of Carolina Lands came uh, National Development Corp Corporation. And uh, my dad actually had no land development experience uh, when he was approached by Mr. Middleton in the late 50s. Uh, we were just talking before this. I don't, I don't want to dominate this. No, go ahead. But uh, there was a guy named uh, Mr. Engel. He, right. He uh, came along and he was a big promoter. And uh, Mr. Middleton needed some lots sold. He had a business model. He admired Alexander Graham Bell. And Alexander Graham Bell had telephones and all these houses and got a couple of bucks every month for each one of them. So Mr. Middleton says, I've got all this land. I need a surveyor and I, I need uh, a contract that I can sell them for a few dollars down and a few dollars a month. And if I can do like that, I can succeed like Alexander Graham Bell did. That was his business model. And so he started, but, but what happened? He didn't have enough money coming in to develop the new properties that he wanted to, to uh, survey some new lots on. So he ran into some financial problems along the way. And uh, it turned out that Mr. Engel was, uh, uh, he was an aggressive salesperson and he was from another part of the country and he didn't fit well with the, with the Brunswick County folks. Uh, so that's when Mr. Middleton called my dad and said, hey, I need a kinder, gentler approach to this thing. You know, we're building a community. We're just not coming in here to hit and run, you know? Yeah. So that's how, that's how daddy got involved. <clears throat> well, I looked up um, the incorporation papers for EF Middleton Company, <clears throat> and it lists Mr. Engel as their agent. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting, it lists the legal address as just Long Beach, uh, Southport, North Carolina. And, of course, back in 1958, which was the date of the incorporation, uh, there were no zip codes. So I found it very interesting. It just, no, no street names, just Long Beach, Southport, North Carolina. Our address was... Uh... You know, Al Templeton, Long Beach, North Carolina. Right. That was it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. because um, Mr. Champion. Yeah. And he knew where our mailbox was. So that was good enough. And, you know, I have a little bit of a tie there. My mother being with the post office in Southport. So she was real close with Ronnie's parents and Mr. Champion. Yeah. I remember that. I remember she did. Yeah. Well, the, what do you think about this? Let's talk about let's talk about Mr. Barbie if you want to. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. 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 You remember the story on him? Uh, he came from uh, Wake Forest. Yes, came yeah. from Wake Forest, and he didn't buy his land either. If you remember that, I do. Uh, you, want, but, you want to touch on that? Well, basically, uh, he started developing one and selling off lots, and so. Um, he would, Mr. Middleton would subordinate to him and uh, he could sell a lot to Mike Royal or Al or Ronnie and then pay, I think he paid some type of a, a smaller fee. And, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Barbie wanted to, he wanted to create Yopon Village. He never said anything about it being a different town. No, no. And so he got this section of property and got the rights to sell it. Uh, so it seemed as if Gib Barbie owned it but he didn't. He was just, he was scrambling like everybody else, trying to get something going yeah. uh, the yeah. best he could. So when yeah. he sold a lot, he had to he had to get a release from Mr. Middleton before he could sell it to that guy. And it was a pretty good relationship. Uh, Mr. Middleton had somebody to sell his lots for him, and Mr. Barbie had his own little community. Well, Mr. Barbie, I think was a was a dreamer too. I think that he saw something that he, was here. He and he did. Um, he did a lot of good things, you know, for that community. And he also helped my family out a little bit, too, after Hazel. Um, we lived up on Long Beach Road and on Dozier Hill there and then um, moved over to the beach in one, an apartment, I think, that he had until we could get our place built back. But he was, a, the best I can recall, he was a very kind 
man, and, and so was the rest of the Barbie family. Um, they were always good to us. I, I, at one point, I was in, in I was, uh, I was welcomed into that Barbie family as, as close as you could. I, I was good friends with all of them. And Mr. Barbie, I never knew, uh, but he, he built a skating rink, uh, uh, a bingo hall, uh, he had putt-putt, he had uh, a pier, and he had some rides in there, Ferris wheel, tilt a whirl things like yeah. that. He made a little, he made something to do. Yeah, you know, well, he, Mike and I talked about that one time. We both worked up at the carnival at one time or another. Didn't everybody? I think no, everybody did. They either worked at the carnival uh, or yeah. Jones's restaurant uh, or, uh, or Red and White. I worked so, in that Jones kitchen. I worked at the, uh, I worked every, every horrible job on the island. <laughs> did you ever work as a, as a garbage man for the town of Oak Island? Like no, I, I did not. I, <laughs> I, I wasn't allowed. Oh, I you missed that one. That was uh, a great uh, adventure. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't much fun. But they had some people up in Yopon, too. Uh, Mr. Sinclair moved down from uh, Clinton, and he built the uh, Sinclair Motel, mm -hmm. a coastal motel. That was the name Coastal Motel, yeah. And he had that place on the corner that his nephew ran, uh, Linwood King. They call him Fat Boy. And uh, he had a Jeep. He drove around on the side. It said Fat Boy King on the side of the boat of the, uh, of the Jeep. Yeah. Well, you, do you know where his store was? His store was, he built a supermarket up there and it was where um, Tommy Robbins had a little flower shop up there on Oak Island Drive right across from the uh, Yoke Palm Beach Fire Station. And um, little supermarket. Yeah, I think I know where you're yeah. talking about. Didn't uh, Mr. Rogers also have his construction business there for a while? Uh, he did. He did. He had, it, he had it right up in there. That was a little later on. But yeah, in the 50s, uh, if we're, if we're following the timeline, I'm okay. here. Uh, <clears throat> but I know the area that you're talking about. Yeah. But Mr. Sinclair, he was another dreamer who came. And, and I don't know all what he had in Clinton, but when he he came to Yopon, he put it all in. He had to because he built a – did he have a pool there? Didn't he have a little Is that, pool? It's still there, actually. Yeah. Didn't he yeah. own that little yeah. station? No, that was more recent. Had a little station right there on the corner of Barbie and, yeah, uh, and, and that's Donald what Linwood King ran. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, no, and, uh, at first, and then he built the one further. That's down right. There. That that was his first store yeah. that he moved down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you go right in that same area, everybody remembers Luke Ap Apple probably. Uh, yeah. Yep. Luke was a, a character. He, I think Luke has lived so long because he knows where all the bodies are buried. Over <laughs> <laughs> He's uh. He's got volumes of, uh, of pads just like this, legal pads, that he wrote out the whole story. He's got a whole history, and he won't let anybody see it. Yeah, yeah, Luke. Uh, yeah we'd stop in at Luke's and get uh, soft drinks and beer. And yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, me too. But, but the guy so who built that store was Raymond Hallman. And yeah, Luke I was just going to ask you about that. Him. I think he had a daughter, Sandra. But Luke, Luke actually made that location there yeah. in, in Maryburg. They worked very hard on that. Well, they were always open. If that, you always, 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 always. Um, and across the street from there, you want what about the gift shop, Gay's gift shop, and the Gay, show shop? Gay Ormley was her name, and uh, she had some. I don't know if they were her grandchildren or her nephews or what, but uh, Debbie Brewer and, and Tom yeah. lived across there. But she had a little, uh, was it Gay or Miss King who had the laundromat? Miss King had Ms. the laundromat. Miss King had, had the laundromat. Jack Adams did all the Clinton work. That's right. right. That's right. That's another character from the beach. His name was Jack, Jack Adams. And uh, he had a great big truck, looked like a great big uh, bread truck. It was a bread truck. It was. A bread. <laughs> and he took a brush and he wrote on there, Jack Fix it so they call him jack fix it and uh he did plumbing electrical he was a smart man he was and of course he had a, a son named uh, mac and mac was all about our age or younger than yeah. me, you guys age and mac was uh he, he was loved by all he was like the mac cutest. Was, yeah mac was as much a character as jack he was. was mac was he was a cute child and everybody loved him and uh jack um 
uh, I don't think he'd mind us saying, but Jack had a fondness for the grape yeah. <laughs> or the bottle. He, <laughs> he drank a good bit and he didn't always tend to act like he, like he could have or should have. And, uh, so everybody kind of felt uh, patronly and matronly towards towards Mac, and they would uh, take him in, and you know he would stay there for a day or two. And there was a preacher, a uh, minister up at the uh, Methodist Church, his name was Horace Hawes, and Mac just uh, Horace went to Jack Fix it one time, and he says, "Jack, I'm taking Mac away from you for a while. He's going to come live with me." And so that's what he did. He took Mac in, got him all cleaned up, and got him yeah. some clothes and fed him well, showers every night. And, uh, you know, then he transitioned all, you know, back to Jack. Uh, and then they had a grandmother who moved down. So that kind of solved Ms. Cross. Yes, Mrs. Kind of, Mrs. Yeah, Cross. Cross. But anyway, Jack was an early character of the beach. He, he was a vagabond, though. He didn't stay places too long. Uh, he was a very smart guy and he was very close to my mother. She she thought the world. Well, he had some redeeming qualities that he did. Yeah, he, can, he was a very good guy. Yeah, he, it's, it's funny that he, he we can talk about him being sorry in the way he raised his son, but we still we loved him and we loved his son. He uh, actually he actually died in our store. He had a heart attack sitting at the counter drinking. Oh, shorts. Shannon's. He was in Shannon's store. And right? he just fell over dead. And, uh, and then Mac was really left on his own day. And that was pretty tragic at the time and uh, yeah. but Max survived and yeah. he, he was a yeah. survivor yeah yeah uh, down at uh in that same area of Yokon uh C.E. Murphy moved in and I'm not sure where he came from uh I did know uh but he moved in there and he built a hotel down on the ocean front out on the ocean front it was a pretty big hotel and yeah, he, I remember that. Went around the, he was in the construction business and he built a lot of center block houses on the beach. That was a primary building construction at the time. Well, uh, so did, um, who was the other? Jack Allen. Jack built, Allen. Jack Allen built a bunch of houses. Jack was slow to pay some people. <laughs> got <him> shot. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, Jack, Jack was, uh, he was a popular man on Friday because all his, his subs came around. And, and one time Jack had refused to pay this guy uh, or couldn't pay him. So the guy said, if you don't pay me, I'll shoot you. And, and that's what happened. <laughs> uh, Jack lost his leg, but he continued to he build. He continued to build, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so well, some of these people you mentioned. So I remember C.E. Murphy, his son. But I also remember him from Southport High School. He played football as well. So, Al, you being a little older than me and Ronnie, where did C.E. fit in with you and your age group? Was he a little older than you as well? He was, a, he was older. Um, okay. I think he graduated in 63, uh, something okay. like that. Uh, C.E. was an outstanding athlete. Uh, yeah. He was a quarterback for the football team, all state. Basketball, the same thing, and baseball. And I, I ended up, I never played in high school with CE. He was gone by the time I got there. Uh, but I did play, you know, they had that little semi-pro baseball league. With South yeah. Fork sales to, to, mm -hmm. And so I played on that team with him a, a couple of years after high school. I know you hear about the people playing baseball that were 40 years old. I played until I was 22. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> but see, he was a good player. He he uh, was a good hitter, and he was a left-handed pitcher. And uh, he, he he wasn't always the easiest guy to get along with, but he was a good teammate. He was a, he was a good person. He married Martha Harrison. Right. Dan's. Uh, well, actually, Ronnie's cousin married her. That's right. Yeah, he, he went up to play ball at Chawan. He played at Chawan yeah. Junior College, yeah. and uh, I remember he came home one time and they, they, had, they had hung him in effigy. <laughs> <laughs> he went to play this team, and they had a thing with with uh, he, with CE. They had him hung from a tree. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, another person up in that area, uh, the Barbies built a gas station, an ESSO station, and they got J.B. Worth. And they got J.B. to come from Bolivia. He was working at Elmore Motors uh, as a mechanic. 
and everybody would take the car to JB. Well, the Barbies brought him in and put him in that street on the corner of Barbie Boulevard and the highway there. And he was, he was a good man, a good, hardworking guy. Um, yeah, he, we would stop in there. Um, Dad and Mom always tried to make the rounds at night and check out things. And we'd stop in there and visit with JB. And he was really a nice guy. Really yeah. Nice guy. It was, is, that, uh, is that the family of Diane Worth? Yes, yeah, that's Diane's mom and dad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and she was, uh, uh, I can't even get into that. But anyway, she, uh, Gilda Rogers, Roscoe's wife, they were sisters. They were sisters. Okay. But they, they, they ran that for a, a long time. Uh, and that was the go-to place to get your car mm -hmm. here at the beach. And, yeah. and that was, uh, you talk about a dreamer. He had a dream of making a go of it there. And he did. Yeah. He did. Had a great, great business there. Yeah. Up in Yopon, there's another guy we haven't mentioned. He was a, uh, Ronnie talked about working on the garbage truck. They had a guy there named Robert Sellers. Robert, Robert was the chief of police. He drove the garbage truck, head of public works. He did everything, everything in the town. Uh, and they even named a street after him up there, Sellers, Sellers Street. And he had a counterpart at Long Beach who kind of did the same thing. You can talk to Sam. Sam, Sam Deese. You, you know, uh, remember Tommy Cole? Yeah. And it was his stepdad, but Sam did basically the same thing for the town. Uh, ran the motor graders. He picked up trash and uh, organized up where you paved streets, not paved streets, but graded streets. And uh, he did everything. Put in water taps. I worked uh, one summer with Sam and uh, I told him I traveled all around the world with him. I, I left home with him when he went off to the Second World War and, and came back after that. So, <laughs> but I traveled everywhere with Sam. He was a one he was, heck a, nice he was an invaluable uh, employee of the, of the town. I, mean, I don't know how they could have gotten. They would have hired three people to take yeah. care, take his yeah. place. And know? you know, uh, the town of Oak Island hired a, a lot of us kids. Um, the Helms family, in particular, I think most of every one of them worked for the town at one time or another. Myron was a, a police officer there, and then Tommy and Jerry in later years were all on the volunteer fire department and rescue squad. And, um, you know, the Helms came to, to Long Beach in around 1949. Yeah. And talk, talk about them a little bit. They were uh, the hard working. Hard working families. There, there's, there's some of those people that uh, don't get mentioned a lot, but they contributed to the success of the island. Um, I think, I don't remember how many children were in the family, but the closest one to me was, uh, was Mike. Um, he was the youngest and I believe he was uh, uh, two years difference in our age. And then Jerry and Billy and Tommy and um, Myron, Becky and Myron. And Myron and all that. They, they, but yeah, they, long, they're long. hard working. And, um, and of course, Hazel destroyed everything they had. And then afterwards, when dad started building the, the store back, he had a on the one end of it was a was a grease pit and he was going to be a mechanic and do all that type of stuff and found out there wasn't a demand and so he filled the grease pit in and Mr. Helms leased uh, the end of that building to put a fish market in and so they ran that market um, for years and years and years and then it just where it wasn't as part They lived in a, uh, it, I don't know, I never went in there but it was almost like a one room house. It, I know there were more but it was a very small uh, space for a lot of people to live. Well, you might be thinking about where Sam lived. Sam lived in a little house behind him. Okay. And, and there was a big house that was right next to Lucy and Jimmy. Actually, Jim's. you're right. It was there. Yeah. Yeah, and they yeah, had, yeah. it's like yeah. a shotgun yeah. plan. It's a big open area. That's right. Down. And they lived next to the fish market. There. Yeah. And it was a whole life. Well, yeah, I remember I told you my universe was the center of my universe was right here at 49th Street and it went uh -huh. as far as 40th Street that way and 58th that uh -huh. way. Uh -huh. That was our world. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was it, a good little, good little community. Well, you know, it's like you said, the, the town only had a hundred and something people in it in the 60s, so I didn't have to travel to see them. They all came there. And um, well, I told Ronnie that at the, at the time that there were 102 people living at the beach, uh, they had four people in their family, okay? So that means they only had 98 customers available to <laughs> to get through the winter on. Right. And at that time, at, at Long Beach had 102. Yopon Beach had 89. So we're talking some some vast stretches of, of property there. The, the island was 12 miles long and less than a mile wide. 
And so the, we had a school bus to, to get to school on, was it bus 48? 48. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the bus would go through the entire island of Long Beach, pick them up, go to Yopon, Caswell, and then pick up everybody on the way to Southport, and you still didn't fill the bus. <laughs> You stopped in Southport with city limits and picked up another 12 or so Maybe people yeah. like that. Yeah. And and it was still plenty of room. Still plenty there of room. There was nobody there. Yeah. There was, if you had a friend, you say, okay, I live at Long Beach and a buddy lives at Long Beach, you, you might be five miles apart. Hmm. You know, you yeah. couldn't, and there was no traffic. That's what I want to, <laughs> if you've ever been told by your mother to go hitchhike, uh, she was you, punishing you. She, she, <laughs> you. You could, you had to start walking, so maybe you would run a car up the road somewhere. But you could literally stand there for twenty minutes at the time. You better walk. And there was no car coming by. And that was the darkest stretch of road from uh, coming in there from Long Beach Road to Two Eleven, all the way up to Yopon. That was the darkest stretch of road. Oh no, there was no, no lights. <laughs> no, you get there, you get there to where old Carl Stidham and them live there, and a little bit of lights there. Then the Helms had that second house there. Yes, they did. Yes, and they then did. the bridge had some lights on it, and that was about the end of it. Yeah, it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty bleak in there. <laughs> were there any out. lights? Were there any lights at Buddy Brown's house? Uh, no, they, Buddy went to bed about seven thirty every night. <laughs> right, Buddy Brown. If, if, if we, let's touch on him. Let's do it. Yeah. Where did he live first? That you remember? I always remember him living down at the foot of the bridge. I never remembered him living out in that shack on the right. He lived up next to the swing bridge. He had a little, I don't know what he did, but he he, he took some boards somehow and they, he had a little, a little, spot shack, up, there, a little yeah. shack up there. And then he moved on to the mainland right there, just as you, just on the right. Um, but when I first met him, he didn't have a beard. He's kind of clean shaven or, or really? relatively clean shaven. Uh, but then, of course, everybody who knew him knows that his beard came way down here and his hair was wild and had a little hat to pipe, but he still had a gleam in his eye. He was a good, he liked to drink one beer. He would sit and drink one beer. Sit under uh, there in the, yeah, the store yeah. and you fill her up and yeah. drink a beer. Yeah, he would. He was good. Uh, yeah, his wife, Emma, they, they, were, they were good people, actually. They were. She, she, um, she had a little... She, I don't know how to say this. She did, her eyes weren't, uh, they weren't focused. aligned. They weren't aligned yeah. at all. <laughs> so she would, you had a hard time knowing if she was talking to you or talking to, talking to Ronnie, you know, but, but she was sweet as could be. And she would, she was active at the Ocean View Church. Uh, Buddy could fish, he could mend nets, uh, he, he, he had crabs. Yeah. He sold crabs, what yeah. I meant to say. But then he would, but then he would uh, fix your lawnmower too. So he was a he was a good man. He was good. Mr. Middleton would pull in in his big Lincoln up there and just stop and sit and talk to him for a while. Yeah. And, uh, Mr. Middleton was about as dry as you could get. Uh, he I remember I got a basketball for Christmas one time and he was sitting there and he had the basketball in his hand. He said, "This is the first time I ever held one of these things in my hand." And he was an old man. And uh, I asked my daddy about it. He says, son, I don't think Uncle Ernest knows how many cards are in a deck. All he knows is that town. All he wants to do is build that town. I don't know of any other interest that he has. So, but he did like Muddy. Well, he, he loved Long Beach. He did. He did. He, he did love it. He did. You remember when they had the party for him down there on the beachfront? Oh, yeah. And yeah, that was, well, I could get one birthday party or something. Didn't he get a Lincoln or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got that blue Continental. I remember Daddy called, he called the place in, uh, it was on North 17 in, in Wilmington, asking if they'd bring the, a Lincoln yeah. by the end of the week. So yeah. they did. That was a blue one. Yeah, way. they did. They did. Yeah. That was in, uh, the cottage was the carriage house. Right down from the store. It was. It was right there. And uh, Mrs. Middleton, you know, they lived on uh, South Battery in Charleston. She played bridge with her ladies every day. And yeah. uh, she brought her ladies up to that party. And uh, 
I think she was quite surprised at the the people who came through on Mr. Middleton's birthday to pay respects to him. Not all of them were were dressed how she thought they ought to dress. No, no, no I'm sure they weren't. <laughs> but, you know, there's a talk. We talked a little bit about Jimmy Bigford and Lucy Bigford, if you want to. They, yeah, they yeah. were. Um, I didn't know they were carnival people originally, but uh, they did. Jimmy, um, I think you went to school. You remember Mark Bigford? Yeah, um, I do. This would be his uncle. But uh, Jimmy did was a, a jack of all trades as well. He worked for the town. Um, he did the garbage pickups. He ran the sprayer. I don't even think they had a sprayer back then, but uh, they did. Uh, he did everything. Well, he was chief of police for a while. That's right. Yeah. And he and dad, we talked about this, had a carnival down there next to the um, pavilion. They did. And ran it they into did. a hazel. And um, Jimmy built the Long Beach Pier. He was a contractor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Blow or something like Sherman Blow. Sherman Blow. Was Sherman a, Blow he was a guy in finance of that. Yeah. But Jimmy was a contractor. I didn't know that. It. Yeah. I'll be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did he do, did he build the um, Long Beach Motel as well for him? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I, I think he was more Marine stuff. I don't okay. think he built it. Okay. And speaking about that, you know, Carl Watkins and his family, uh, Mary Tomlinson's uncle, Carl Watkins, and um, had a son. Chip and a daughter Nancy. Then later years, yeah. Robert and Raymond. But Carl was um, was quite a builder, and he believed in the island as well. He and um, Robert Jones established Blue Water Point Marina and got it going. But um, Carl built a lot of houses, and uh, in fact, he built the service station for Dad on Oconee yes, Drive. And uh, but Carl was quite a talented individual. Um, could play several musical instruments and. Uh, was a car, he could carve marvelous things and um, was instrumental in the Boy Scouts. He was, he was a big, big Boy Scout leader. He was. You uh, know, um, yeah, you're right. As far as the Boy Scouts, I remember being associated with the Scouts and Mr. Watkins being very involved. I also took piano from his mother, Elizabeth Watkins. Yes, yes, she lived up, um, in later years, lived over on the island. Yeah. Across from the Baptist Church. She was a nice lady as well. I don't know if you're aware of this, but at one time, Carl and Gene Tomlinson, who was the mayor of Southport for 100 yeah. years, yeah. Uh, he and Carl, they were cousins, and they owned the pavilion, the Long Beach Pavilion right. at one time. And they brought bands in there and had, it, 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 actually, all I knew of it was uh, country bands. It, but uh, yeah. I understand they used to have like an orchestra that, Oh, I didn't there, know that. Uh, they uh -huh. came there at times. That everybody got stuck in the ruts. And yeah. Didn't have any they called them clod there. hoppers. They came in from the county. Yeah. They, they came yeah. over and danced yeah. over there. Yeah. yeah. But that pavilion, that was a nice place. I don't remember, obviously, the first one, but the second one I remember. And uh, I believe Nick Coleman and Mary Lou ran it at one point. They did. Yeah. Now, Nick Coleman. Um, we need to, he's an interesting character as well. Nick was the mayor. And Mary Lou was a hairdresser. And if you, if you call up to Central Casting and you said, send me a hairdresser, they would send Mary Lou Coleman. <laughs> she, was, uh, she was a lovely lady. In fact, uh, Al called uh, Sherry and talked to Sherry for a little while the other day. And then he told me, so I got on the phone and talked to Sherry and Debbie. And I miss Mary Lou. I didn't get to talk to her, but she's living up in uh, they live Bellhaven. In, uh, Bellhaven. Yeah. Bellhaven. But I had always heard that the reason I called them is uh, I wanted to make sure we're substantially correct with the things well, we did, put, that we put down here. And I'd always heard that the house that the Colvins lived in was blown up by a hazel and Nick just got it right where it landed and, uh, and, and moved into it. But the, I found out the other day from Mary Lou that uh, it, there's, that's, that's mostly true, but what happened was the house did get blown down by Hazel, and he was a house mover, so he did move it to that location and built around it and made him a place to live. Uh, and Sherry told me that he had to cut the road in to get it up there. Oh, is that right? That's what she told me the other day. Okay. okay. Well, didn't house, it's, they added on to that house a hundred times. Didn't oh, it they, sit they, right they, on the they, corner? Right on the yeah. corner, yeah. yeah. Right, it was is it was it the corner that went down to where your store is, Ronnie? Where your That's store it. was located? 
their their house was on the corner of 46 we we're on corner of 49 and so they were right okay across, okay right across yeah. town hall yeah. yeah yeah okay but nick was an interesting man I, he would uh, he was a shipbuilder a boat builder as well and he did marine construction and he, he was tall and strong no fat on him at no. all he was just a he was a dashing looking guy and he he, he died early, uh, in his early 50s. Yeah, he could have been a, a, a movie star. He, he, he was a handsome man. We yeah. always saw him as this uh, big, tall, dan, uh, tan guy yeah. with swept back hair. And just a, kind of a badass is what he was. Yeah, he, well, he was. Yeah. yeah, But he always treated us good. He, like, he was very good. Could very be he good. treated us good because we didn't give him any trouble because he was so big. I wasn't going to give him No, I never thought about <laughs> it. <laughs> well, Trent both back behind his house. Uh -huh. Swing off uh -huh. You know who popped in my mind was Mike Coleman. You yeah, know, particularly yeah. when you talked about a pretty good-looking guy that could have had those movie star looks. You know, Mike yeah. Coleman. Yeah. Unfortunately, he died early too. He did. Yeah, I heard. That was a, I, I was very unexpected when he passed, and uh, yeah. it kind of tore that family up when he left. They, yeah, uh, they, yeah. They, they, that, that was bad. Uh, you know, I was trying to think of, we're, we're trying to keep with the theme of people who who came and, and, and gambled at all to move there. And uh, there's there's the Jones family of Jarvis and LD and Larry and Ray and, and those right. guys. Right. Um, and they they were from uh, Winnebago, from the Ash area. Uh, that oh, side of, yeah, that side of the county. Yeah. No, that's Doug Lewis is from Paulsboro. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and LD was in the Navy, and I think he retired from the Navy and started running. If you ever been to Calabash, you go to Beck Seafood, he ran Beck's. Okay. And Jarvis worked there for him, and they went on a limb, and they bought a restaurant that was started by Doug Lewis. We'll cover Doug in a second, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, but they took over Trinco Harbor Restaurant, and they took a, a restaurant that was kind of struggling to stay, stay open, and they put the Calabash formula in there, and before you know it, they had lines out the door, and they were a big employer for the That's for, right. for the yeah. uh, a lot of waitresses, dishwashers, mm -hmm. cooks, and uh, they did a great job. They did a good job. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, uh, that we're trying, eating, what, we're, what we're trying to do is show how, how it wasn't just one person that, that made this area great. It was a combination of everybody, big or small. You know, everybody right. has, has contributed to what made this area so good. Yeah. And, and we're going to take credit for something. When Southport had the state championship teams, about half the team came from the beach. Yes. You know, yes. we had C.E. and Donald Dixon and Earl Clewis and uh, Richard Pickett and Billy Helms and, of course, me and Frank Barman. That's right. <laughs> well, Frank ended up coaching me. Frank, one Frank, year. Frank was. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I guess that we'll have to take credit to those Beach Boys, too, when we had those terrible losing seasons when I was a senior. I mean, when <laughs> I was a senior, there, there were more Oak Island boys on there than there was Southport boys, yeah, so yeah. we'll take responsibility yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Doug Cluis is the guy, Southport ended up with a, a, a what was it, a Dodge dealership, Dodge, dealership. Dodge Chrysler yeah. dealership, Plymouth. And yeah. uh, he opened that dealership in Southport, which was a, a big, everybody in Southport was driving a Dodge or a Dodge That's product right. after yeah. that because they wanted to be supportive. Yeah. You know? And uh, the streets were full of Chrysler products. Well, it's an uh, unbearable which drove Dodgers for a long time. Oh, yeah. They, they're done and they both, they, I think they both got Chargers, didn't they? So they got right. something, some hot car. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was another family that state came down and did the well. The Farrells moved down. I will tell you this. And I, I they, they uh, when Willard Farrell moved to, to the beach, he opened a little store down there. And Mr. Middleton just said, well, that's just stupid. We already had the Shannons there in the store. I don't know why he's coming in and, and trying to start another store. Dan Shannon works too hard to have, have somebody <laughs> down the street <laughs> open another store. And so he was never supportive of the Ferrells. Oh, man. Not at all. He was, he was, he was pro Shannon uh, uh, for his whole life, you know? 
Well, we thank him for that too. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. We would go down, we would go down to visit uh, family in Florida, we'd stop sometimes and visit with Mr. Middleton in Charleston, because oh. my uncle was there and we'd swing by. That was a, that was quite a little, he lived on a 138 South Battery, which is if you've ever been to Charleston and you go to Murray Boulevard, which is the battery there, he lived one block over on the corner. You could see the, the Ashley River from his house. Wow. He lived in one of those big houses there that uh, uh, actually he had a small living space, but a very great address right there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had touched on one of our conversations, we touched on uh, Ozzie Lee. Oh, yeah. Do you remember, were, were you old enough to remember Ozzy's Chew and Choke, Mike? No, I don't. He, he had a grill at the Yopon Pier. Oh, okay, okay. He called it Ozzy's Chew and Choke, which was a terrible name. <laughs> but appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but appropriate. <laughs> Do you know that you remember a guy in Southport named Kurt Williams? Yes. He had, he had a raspy voice. He couldn't. He, uh, yeah. His, his vocal cords were compromised somehow. And, I didn't know him. And he played uh, bingo over there. And uh, one time he called, bingo! <laughs> and nobody heard him. Nobody <laughs> heard him. They called it again. They started calling another number. And he stood up and he says, I heard bingo, damn it, bingo! <laughs> <laughs> so, so Ozzy got, got hold of that story. And... Uh, he had a rubber hot dog that he put in a bun. <laughs> and he, uh, Kurt ordered a hot dog from Ozzy, and uh, Ozzy fed him a hot dog with a rubber hot dog in it. <laughs> and Kurt bit into it. He says, rubber hot dog, rubber hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> he was alerting everybody. Oh, oh Ozzy had a rubber hot dog trick on I'll be going yeah. I hadn't heard that story. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Ozzy, uh, he ended up going down to uh, the Long Beach Pier and opened a, a place down there. And uh, Debbie Coleman worked for him. Yeah. And he, he served breakfast. You know, his breakfast was probably about 99 cents a piece yeah. or something. And it, Debbie came to Ozzy one time and she had, uh, the, the tips were usually run about 15 cents to 35 cents back in those days. Mm -hmm. and, she came in, she had either a dollar or two dollars, and she sold it to Robert, to uh, Ozzy. And he had a little business card on, on top of that tip. She handed the, the money and the, and the card, and it says, you have been visited by the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Ozzy took that money and took that card, and he chased those men out into the parking lot. And he threw it all at them I and told them to never, ever come back again. Never heard that Never story. come back again. Well, so really Debbie, happened. I don't know what happened to her tip. I don't know if she got the tip back or I just gave it away. <laughs> but it was out on the parking lot on the, on the ground. I never heard that story. Yeah. That's a good one. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But um, another person we, we need to talk about probably is uh, Dan Walker. Dan Walker was a showman. He, he was a promoter. Yeah, he was a promoter. He was the first town manager we had. And uh, he was instrumental in, in the fox hunt, getting it started. He was. The crab derby. We had that a couple years, I think, didn't we? Yeah, we had, he had a crab derby where you got this big piece of plywood and you squirted water all over it. And every kid got at the top, you know, <laughs> they put a crab in front of it. And they'd pull the board up and they'd squirt it. And, you know, the crab just slide down. And, of course, it, that's... That's where, before I even moved to the beach, I was at, I went to one of those crab derbies and uh, and the kid next to me was Frank Barbie and he had a crab and of course Frank was a little more ambitious than me. But yeah. So Frank bammed on the plywood and his crab made it all the way down. <laughs> so, Dad, Dad was a good man. He, he was good. He ended up in Moorhead City or somewhere I like think, that. I think that's that right. But he, he rented uh, from us and stayed in the apartments back behind the, the store. He was I said, quite a big promoter. He, he so I remember the fox the hunts. Yeah, they needed stuff to get things going. And all in the spirit of trying to get people interested at the, in the beach and yeah. trying to get merchants there. Uh, and Dan was very good at that. He, he, so he, he I have a story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a memory, I should say, 
of when they were selling the lots, Mr. Jimmy Wolf, who I knew from Southport, was was an agent. Now, I don't know if he was with National Development or not, but I can just remember riding over with my parents when I'm like maybe eight years old. And they had this little wooden sales office that every so often after they sold enough lots, they would pick it up and move it and move it down the road. And the last place I remember it was sitting at the corner of Middleton. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'll tell you the other guys too was, uh, give you a Southport name, Dozier Ruark. You remember yeah. Dozier? It was yeah. Lynn and, and, uh, and, and Dozier Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, Doki, they call Doki. him Doki. Yeah. But uh, he sold, he, he worked at Sunny Point at night and then he would sell real estate during the day. He slept a good bit during the, during the day in that little building there. And Jimmy, yeah. of course, oh, what a magnificent man he was. He, he, would, he would wear a powder blue leisure suit with a, with a white hat, white belt, white shoes. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he was on the, he was a peacock who came to work. <laughs> <laughs> he was a wonderful man. Uh, Didn't uh, Mr. Trot work for y'all for a while? He, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. Skeeter uh, Trot's dad? He might have. And maybe he worked up with Barbie. He maybe. worked at Barbie. And right. they, he worked with Barbie and they named Trot Street after him. That's Skeeter right. Trot's dad. Yeah. You know, Dude. I grew up, Skeeter was my neighbor. Uh, I lived at the corner of Rhett and Moore Street, which is right down from the old jail. And in between my house and the old jail is where Skeeter Trot lived. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Overlooking yeah. the cemetery there. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy had these friends who lived on the beach. He, every now and then, you know, some people just couldn't make it at the beach. And they had to pack up and leave and, there was his family. They, I don't know if they had a van or a, a open bed pickup, but they had furniture, suitcases. It was piled high, and they were leaving. They had the husband, the wife, and the two kids in there, and they stopped by the office to see Jimmy on the way out of, out of town. And uh, he, you know, said, "Good to see you. Good to know you. I'm so glad. You know, sorry to see you leave." And the guy said. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I guess it's okay to take this road out of town. And Jimmy said, "Yeah, you do, You've taken everything else. You might as well take <laughs> <laughs> it." Uh, yeah, that, oh, that sounds like a story that was around there. <laughs> his, his son died, and that was a very tragic. Kid, cancer yeah. died at 29. Mm -hmm. Left yep. him behind. He, hey guys, uh, I have a, I have a couple comments from Facebook. Can I um, let you know what they are? Yeah. So uh, this is from Tommy Robbins. Does that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one thing he said is, um, he says, Ozzy's son, Brad, and I painted his 49 Chevy with a gallon of black paint and two brushes. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then he says two things that I don't understand, but maybe you do. One is Brunswick Motors. Just mentioned that. And the yeah, that's is, dub. That's dub. That's dub fluids. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the other is Batman Farrell. That's Don Farrell. That's Don Farrell. Okay. All right. Uh, he, he's uh, Mr. Fafford. Yeah. So anyway, Mr. Farrell did real well by his kids. He bought them all cars. And uh, Don was Batman. Yeah. He remember he drove that hearse for a while. He did. He those did. surfboards in the back of it. Yeah. And then he opened up that little grill, surfs up grill inside that building. He did. They did. Didn't he drive... An Oldsmobile 442. I don't know who that 442. Uh, I think think that was Johnny Bellamy had the 442. Oh, you're right. It was, you're right. It yeah. was Johnny. Yeah, it was. But those were those old muscle cars were hot. Uh, they were nice. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Those yeah. days are gone. Speaking of Johnny Bellamy, Bellamy, Bellamy. So I'm Lorraine, Lorraine and Clint. We're still alive. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're off Facebook. Is that what she said? Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. On, they're, they're on Facebook, Facebook looking at us. Yeah. They're, oh, watching, okay. oh, they're watching this on Facebook. Okay. okay. Mary, yeah. There are people watching on Facebook. Mary Ellen uh, uh, Watch Pool said, thank you very much to the three of you. And then uh, Kathy, St. I think she hit Kathy St. George Johnston. I think she hit Anna too quick. She said, I worked for Mr. 
She worked yeah. for Jimmy Wolf when he was up at the in an office under the water tower in Southport. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, and she, I think she ended up with Jimmy Wolf's son's car. The Larry Wolf passed away at twenty nine. Uh, I think Kathy bought that car from from them. That's how she ended up with it. Hey, let me hit on one little thing. I was thinking about Mr. Middleton and, and his vision for this area. Yeah. Uh, back in nineteen forty one, after the the railroad had left Southport, right. Uh, Mr. Middleton had big dreams about reestablishing the rail service. He certainly did. So he uh, he formed a corporation along with my grandfather, Shannon, and uh, Bun Frank, and um, some, a mixture, McNeil, I believe, and some others. That's right. Southport Transportation That's right. Corporation. And, uh, of course, it never materialized in anything. And there also was a, a train that came. I, that I shouldn't talk on this because I really don't know, but wasn't there a train bed that came across to the beach at one point? I think it did serve as yeah. casual. Yeah, that's what someone else out there. It went, yeah. it, it went yeah. as far as I know to the Menhaden factories that yeah. came across. It came to the fish factory. Yeah. Okay. okay. We have a couple, a couple more comments on Facebook. I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but people want to. Uh, one is um, Tommy Robbins says, Ronnie, you were one of the first three people that he knew at Long Beach. So. Yeah, sure I remember Tommy well. You know, in fact, his dad uh, opened up the restaurant um, at the steakhouse down there at the bottom of Shea, Norton. Shea Steak. Yeah, about the bottom of Norton. But they also, Mr. Robbins also had Yesup Station. He did. He ran that in later years. Uh, and Tommy worked there. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I bought a car from Tommy. Yeah. How'd that work yes. out? It worked out pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve Ganey uh, said to ask you about Ed Morgan. Oh, Ed Morgan was another uh, real estate guy. He did a lot of work down there, and he was um, involved in politics. And he was mayor one time. He was mayor at one time, and a nice guy. He had uh, two daughters, uh, Diana and, and Paula, and, yeah. uh, very nice girls. And uh, both of them are still living on the beach. I think um, Diana retired from the clerk of court, and Paula retired as a teacher, I believe. Yeah. Miss Clemens yeah. is her name. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Okay. And Tommy says, uh, he says, came to Dutchman Acres train track. So I think he's talking about that train that you guys were mentioning a minute ago. He said it came to Dutchman Acres train track. Does that? Well, bring back? the track crossed yeah. Dutchman's Creek ah. and there was a trestle and I used to go up there. I like to fish at that trestle. So I'd go up Dutchman's yeah. Creek, but it headed across the marsh area and went to the uh, fish factories. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's some, uh, you know, we, we we were trying real hard to remember everybody we could and, and we wanted to make a sort of little, little uh, disclaimer here at the beginning, it, it, which we didn't do it. We're going to forget people and we didn't, you know, there, there's people we didn't bring up. Uh, Jimmy, well, well, we brought Jimmy, there was Tom Bomer and uh, Sheriff E.V. Leonard. I'll tell you what, you write all that now. And you come back and do it again. <laughs> okay, we got a few people who just didn't. We, we didn't I feel bad about it because a lot of people worked real hard to do that. And I, I feel bad about not mentioning them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, well we only have an hour, so, <laughs> so you could, like Bob said, you can come back and do it again. Yeah. Um, can, so, uh, Al, would you mind telling that story? You told it right before we, I turned on the recording about how your dad got, uh, how Mr. Middleton kind of got to well, how he hired your dad, how he came to notice your dad. My, my dad's, uh, we're, we're related. Uh, Mr. Middleton married my grandmother's sister. So all my life, he was Uncle Ernest. All my dad's life, he was Uncle Ernest. And uh, a, a tidbit about that is, every, is, is his wife was Cecile Rogers Middleton, who was my aunt. And uh, she always addressed him as Mr. Middleton, her husband. And <laughs> if, she, if it wasn't Mr. Middleton, she called him, she referred to him as EF. And he called her affectionately, wife. Oh. Wife, you're ready for dinner. Wife, you're ready to go. And that, that was their relationship. And it was, they had a long and loving relationship. They were great. But, Everybody, he never inspired, nobody ever called him Ernie. 
<laughs> he was always EF or Mr. Miller. And to us, he was Uncle Ernest. <laughs> and can you tell the story about the tea? The, the Tetley tea? The, about the what? The Tetley tea? You were telling the story about the Tetley oh, tea? Oh, oh, oh. Um, my, my dad didn't finish high school, so he had to take any job that he could get. He was a smart, learned, refined man who, because of the Second World War, did not finish school. And so my mother was determined that he wasn't going to work for a factory, a plant. And she made sure he wore a white shirt and a tie and went to work. So he was working for General Foods selling uh, Tetley tea and Maxwell House coffee and whatever. And he was trying to make a name for himself. He was scrambling to get out of nothing. And uh, he moved to a little town in Georgia, Sylvania, Georgia. So daddy had these little bottles. He might have used one bottle, I don't know. But he would go to, up to a house and ask for a water sample. And he would tell the lady, this is back when women were always home, you know. And he would ask for a water sample. And he said there were, Tetley Tea was formulating a tea for the region, the regional water flavor profile. And uh, so he would take that and go back and go to the next house. And a lot of houses were far apart, but he would go to this whole area. And I don't know if he had a bunch of bottles or if he had one and poured it out every time, but it was, so suddenly Tetley T started just flying off the shelves in these, this little town. And he won some national sales awards. And they wanted us to move to Battle Creek, Michigan. And of course he said, no, 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 we ain't doing that. So we did move to New Orleans and then we moved back uh, to this area. And uh, Mr. Middleton, of course in the family, everybody knew about my dad's uh, uh, achievement. And he said, well, come on, I need a promoter. He wanted it at the time, he wanted to, he had gotten rid of uh, Mr. Engel because he was just way too aggressive and he, he just needed a man with a little more composure to come in there and get it done. So that's, that was why, uh, uh, that's what attracted Mr. Middleton to, to Danny's qualifications. That's a great story. Yeah, it um, is. I have, a, I have a question for you guys about, and when you were talking about uh, growing up on the island and then going to, over to school in um, Southport, and you know they're the Oak Island boys and the Southport boys. Was there was there ever a feeling like if you if you were living on the island, did you ever think, oh, I wish I lived in Southport where there's more going on? Or if you lived, or Mike, if you lived in Southport, did you ever think, I wish I lived in Oak Island, you know, near the beach? Or did everybody just feel like they were in the place they were supposed to be? I'm still yeah, where I'm think, supposed to be. Yeah, I think I, I felt I lived in the place I was supposed to be but I love the beach and I, I never thought of it as a separate entity. I just felt like it was our community. Oh, okay. Yeah. I love the whole arrangement, but I need to get to Southport. I, I would jump in the back of a pickup truck and, and get to yeah. Southport. And that was like, my mother was pretty protective. Of me, yeah. You know, yeah. growing up, but we got to the beach. It's like she threw away the rule book. <laughs> you guys get out there and go for it. You know, well, you well, know, I mean, with 100 people, everybody knows everybody, and the chances of getting in trouble is fairly remote. You know, somebody would tell them or spank you while you were there. Mike, they had a, uh, they built a new uh, uh, car wash at Yopon one time, and I was driving my mother's car, and I wanted to go by and put a quarter in there and, and yeah. screw the car off. Well, I did that. It's about 11 o'clock one night. I woke up the next morning. And my dad comes in there and says, you want to tell me what you were doing having to wash your mother's car last night? Oh, no. <laughs> everybody knows You were everybody. in bed. That's you were right. in bed when I came home. How Did somebody call him that morning and say, I saw Al yeah. washing the car? You know they did. <laughs> you know. Could have been Mr. Lewis. Yeah. He was probably well, yeah. Try growing up when your mother worked the window at the post office. I know. <laughs> Everything got back to my mom. Well, I'll tell you a little story about your mother. Uh, I had gotten in trouble at school, and so they were sending out letters, and I heard about the letters going out. So I went down to the post office, and I was going to catch your mom and see if she couldn't pull that letter out for me, <laughs> or she wouldn't, and uh, it got to the house. And I, I got she wouldn't the break the rules. <laughs> no, she wouldn't break the rules. But, uh, I, got, I got a couple more comments here. Uh, let's see. Tommy Robbins says um, it was a 1966 cyclone 
that Ronnie bought from me, I wish I would never have sold it. <laughs> yeah, well, it cost me enough. I wish he had never sold it too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, I dug up, I think he's talking about the railroad again. He says, I dug up part of it one night digging CP and L Canal. And um, Kathy John yeah. Johnson says, it only took just a few minutes to get to the beach back then and vice versa. That surprises me, only a few minutes. And um, Tommy says, Ronnie, tell them about the full contact football on the first row on Norton Street, Yopon. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what we did. Yeah. We just played yeah. full contact football on the, on the sand yeah. lots. And uh, there was always a game going on, either down there at the bottom of Norton or down in front of our yeah. place. And you know what I think about when I think of those games? Sherry Coleman. She was <laughs> tough. Wasn't she? she was as tough as nails. <laughs> Uh, she would you'd run that ball, she would take you down like yes. a child. <laughs> oh gosh, she was something else. And she she was quite accomplished in uh, in her own right. You know, she was a commissioner and she worked she, real she hard was. in the real estate business and did extremely when Nick well. Cole, when Nick Coleman died, he was building docks and piers and uh right uh, bulkheads and stuff. Sherry took that business over and Sherry had a has a degree in marine biology from UNCW, and it, there she was. Like driving pilots and stuff. Well, she yeah. didn't miss a beat, did she? She no, jumped right in there. She did. She did. And Mike, actually, Mike did some uh, when he was between jobs. When he worked with Dupont, I believe he did. And, he did. Um, I think he would do some uh, marine work too uh, on the side. And he did. And Debbie uh, moved up to um, the Raleigh area and she did. and did hairdressing and stuff up there. Took after her mother's trade. And, uh, I remember uh, let my hair grow out real long back when I was in high school and. Uh, met my first wife, and she didn't particularly like that long hair, and old Debbie cut it off for me. Well, right she did the right thing, because, you know, you look much better now. Well, I, I wouldn't thing. know about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I, uh, you know, I, you guys, this is just, you know, just great. And there's just so much information in there. It's just fantastic. But... No, the time's running. Yeah, right, right. right. Well, we got it. We're sure. about ready. We're but about I'm, not, ready. I'm not going to turn the clock off until you until you say we're coming. We're going to come back. Yeah, we're we're pretty much wrapped up here. Yeah, uh, there might be some people we could get, but we couldn't give them any time. Yeah. yeah, All right. Well, I think well, I good. thoroughly Thank enjoyed it. Thank you both for sharing. You know, in the perspective of telling the history through the families, I really liked the way you did that. So thanks a lot, guys. Good Appreciate job. it. Thanks, Thanks for having us. And yeah. We'll do it again. <laughs> yep. Liz, you got anything to, find, to follow up with? Uh, no, just uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming, and I do hope you come back because uh, this was the we've had fun. It's been, it's been, it's been, been an honor. Well, I, I've been, I've enjoyed getting up with Alan again and, and reminiscing <laughs> about all times as much as I have this. We we touched on a lot of good things and some you know, good friendships. The, the first call we made to each other was like, "What do you think we can can we come up with any information?" <laughs> we were like an hour and a half with each other, <laughs> right? So, no, so it has been fun. It has been an honor. Great. Really Thank you. It. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye, you. guys. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye, everybody.